I'm, I'm not going to do a rambling introduction. Richard needs no real introduction to any of you who've been involved in social care for, for over the last 25 years. So I'm going to ask, Richard has just published a book. There are probably some signed copies, may even be, even be some unsigned copies, which are, you know, um, are available for you to, available to, you to buy, um, probably. Um, Richard, let me pass over to you to kick off the sort of where have we come from and where we're going to in terms of, in terms of social care. Thank you very much, David. And um, it's an honour to be here. I just very briefly want to mention Sally, because um, social care was an issue that Sally Greengross cared very much about. And it was a great honour and a joy uh, to work with her on the Barker Commission back in 2000 and 2013, 2014, um, at the King's Fund. And, uh, and her contributions to the debate will be hugely missed. So, um, social care, well... Um, Wrong clicker. Sorry. Always helps to use the right bit of technology, doesn't it? So, um, instead of going back 25 years, I thought I'd go back 165 years to this wonderful, evocative introduction to A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. And uh, the best of times, the worst of times, and there will be some phrases there which, which I think will resonate with our current circumstances, um, like... The season, of, um, the season of darkness, the winter of despair. So what's the best of times, you're wondering? Well, I mean, I, I want to put it to you that the fact that social care is now one of the most pressing public policy issues of our generation is because of success, the success of our longer lives. That, and I think to this audience, I don't need to spell that out, that thanks to social and economic and other advances over the last century. Most of us are generally living longer, healthier and wealthier lives than our grandparents could ever have imagined. Longevity, of course, is not just older people. There are more younger people with disabilities and health conditions that are living longer too. So we need to think through the policy challenges of this success story, not just about funding, not just about models of care, but particular other issues like the, the numbers of people with learning disability that are living into old age, the burgeoning population in our prisons with dementia and frailty and other kinds of care needs. Um, and, and the fact is that today most of us, because of, of our, our successes, most of us at some point in our lives will have some kind of care and support need. And one in seven of us will need care that costs at least £100,000. The worst of times, um, let's go back to that briefly, is the fact that we're happy to reap the benefits of longer lives, but our political system and policy making has lamentably failed to think through uh, the consequences um, <coughs> of that. And um, many of you have seen this slide before, this procession of white papers, green papers, consultations, never mind all the reviews and commissions and and yet even now we struggle to see through and implement even the most modest of reform proposals following the chancellor's uh, statement last week so this is a quarter of a century of uh, policy failure and it's not through want of trying some of the the brightest uh, brains and the best of efforts in, in Whitehall, in think tanks, in academia, have come up with all sorts of ideas and options, and yet we struggle to really tackle um, the fundamental problems of, of social care. Um, so this is a, you know, a really good example of, of our failure to think through uh, the consequences. Um, and you know, we reap what we haven't sown. And, um, and I don't want to kind of, these are just a couple of the symptoms. We have the most, the deepest workforce crisis I have ever known in my 45 years working in social care, that we've actually got fewer people working in social care this year than we did the year before, and an astonishing leap in vacancy rates. This is deeply troubling. So no surprise that 
over half a million people now are waiting either for an assessment of their care needs um, or, or a care package. Um, and, you know, this is a consequence of not, not tackling the, the underlying issues. It's as, though, um, it's as though successive governments have taken to heart something that the late Peter Cook said when he said, I have learned from my mistakes and I'm sure I can repeat them exactly. <laughs> Great, isn't it? Um, and that, in, I mean, that goes to all governments, I should say, over the last uh, 25 years. Um, and there's, I mean, there's lots of kind of layers of issues about why we have got into this mess. Um, somebody really ought to write a book about it. Oh, hang on a minute. Sorry, sorry. Yes, they already have. Yes, here it is. And, and, and David, you very kindly plugged it. I, I thought, well, it's a bit tawdry, isn't it, to use this great occasion to flog a book. Um, but equally, it would be remiss of me, surely, not to signpost you to relevant material. And I'd be happy to signpost you in more specific ways afterwards if, if you were interested. But anyway, that's, that's, that's enough. Um, but actually, the problems are not just about social care in isolation. And we heard from Ian Diamond about healthy life expectancy. So this is a piece of work, um, piece of work I did a few years back or contributed to at the King's Fund with Catherine Foote, who is here. And she and David Oliver, actually a geretician, did most of the heavy lifting. Um, and we, we came up with, the, we tried to answer the question, what would really good joined up health and social care look like? for older people. And this was, this was our model, um, with the first priority being to support people to age well in their own homes, even if they have health conditions and long-term long -term health issues. But in reality today, we find that a disproportionate amount of money and attention and time goes into the problems in acute hospitals. So, so a big challenge for the new integrated care systems is not just about social care, but it's about how do we reorient um, our entire health and care system? How do we reconfigure it so that we're shifting the balance of care and support away from hospitals and long-term care towards care in people's own homes and, and maybe as well at the, at the, at the end of life? Um, so... This is a, a bigger, this goes beyond the boundaries of um, social care. Um, and I've kind of made the point that, you know, we've, we've had umpteen white papers, green papers, and the idea that if we just have one more heave that we, we try another kind of failed cycle of policy, traditional policy making, um, that this somehow will, will work. And... And one of the things I kind of argue in, in my book is that we need to find a new road to reform. And I feel that we need to engage directly with the public through all the tools and methods of deliberative democracy to really build up the public's appreciation that social care is not some remote issue affecting a distant minority. It affects all of us. It's crucial to the quality of our lives. Uh, the American campaigner, A. M. Poe, uses the term, the work on which all other work depends. Because without care for our children, for our older people, for our disabled people, people can't go into the workplace. And in a tight labor market, uh, the economic case for social care as well should be more important. So lots of things that we need to do, new, new social contract, a new understanding, a new deal between citizens, the state and intermediate institutions about who does what, not just in relation to paying for care but providing it as well and the role of communities. So some big challenges there but I mean I, I fear that if we, if we don't embark upon a different approach to this we will simply end up um, repeating history instead of learning from it. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And uh, David Willips w once said to me that his publisher had told him he had to hold the book up for 15 seconds, but apparently it was really embarrassing because 15 seconds is a long time. Um, um, I, I'm delighted now that we have, um, I hope, Andy Woodhead to um, join us remotely. Do we have Andy? 
Um, uh, so Andy is, um, Dr. Woodhead is a lecturer, former lawyer and living with dementia um, and really, really grateful, not least because it was only yesterday um, or the day before that he agreed to do this. So thank you very much and um, your response to, 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 to Richard and any other thoughts you have, Andy. Um, I thought a lot of what Richard said was very interesting and I did disagree with any of it. Um, I'm going to have to gallop through a huge agenda that I have simply because I receive um, personal care um, and, and, and I'm doing a lot of things to work on it for other people to make sure that we improve care because anyone um, with an illness wants to stay at home as long as possible and for, to do that we rely on what we call a social care package um, that's something which we need to be discharged from hospital um, my terminal illness um, and people forget it's terminal is dementia i have lewy body and vascular dementia so mixed um, dementia and um, the care uh, pathway that, that we have put together um, in a report in Wales um, with Public Health Wales and the Welsh Government is that we feel, I mean, the essentials are care should be accessible, um, it should be responsive, um, it should follow the journey, so the progression of the illness. We, with dementia, call it our dementia journey. Um, it relies on partnerships, and relationships and most importantly it's underpinned by kindness and understanding um, i want it to include things like fitness and exercise which are very important um, with the condition that i have and i'm sure with lots lots of others diet is important particularly with mixed dementia so correct nutrition medication um, we tend to over medicate people with dementia and that is something which we're looking at i'm working on a study currently um, which is looking at the prescribing of psychotropic drugs to people with dementia in care homes um, it's something rather than giving us something to do it's a way of keeping us um, quiet rather than occupied and i can't I can't um, go through all this without forgetting that mental health is a struggle. Um, anyone um, with a serious illness, um, that is important. And the sorts of things that help our mental health are education, of course, about the um, condition that we have, um, counselling, but also group discussion talking to other people um, that have dementia. I find that um, very important because it makes me feel um, unisolated. Um, we've um, obviously got a care crisis. Let's not um, deny the fact that people are leaving care. They are undervalued and um, dare I say, in a majority of cases, they are probably underpaid. Um, and the majority of carers are actually unpaid carers. So let's not forget that. We rely on our families for care. Um, now, I've seen a statistic which suggests that 95% of carers are unpaid carers. In other words, our families, when our carers aren't there, uh, they are the people that we rely on for um, our, our support. Um, what care needs really is a cultural change um, because um, we undervalue them. Um, I don't think it's just about pay, which I mentioned. Carers aren't cleaners. Um, a day's training alongside um, a supervisor in a, with a private care agency and then being told you're on your own. Um, these are the people that you go and see. Make sure that they're comfortable, the house is clean, they've had something to eat, um, they've taken their medication. Um, I, I, think, I think a short course of training 
um, isn't something um, which is um, good enough, is better than nothing. But I think the training that we give um, the carers that we rely on um, isn't enough. I rely a lot on occupational therapy, th physiotherapy, um, my GP and of course A&E services like everyone else, neurological um, support. But one of the things that I think is important in trying to change um, um, the way that um, I'm cared for and the way that people with um, terminal illnesses or other long-term illnesses are cared for is through co-production. So in other words, involve people like me um, when you're um, designing your strategies, um, you know, um, talk to us, ask us what, what we would like, um, but don't just consult. People think consultation is co-production. It is not. It is something entirely different. It is important. But co-production means involving people in the actual design of the care so that it's fit for purpose. Um, and that's um, something um, which is um, critical. You mentioned palliative care. I'm working on a study um, at the moment with um, King's College um, in London, Cambridge University, um, Queens have now joined us from Belfast and um, the medical schools in York University and Hull, which are combined, um, have joined to look at palliative care at home um, rather than going into a hospice or into the hospital um, for that care. And we're looking at how palliative care at home um, can be improved. And this is being done through co-production. That's the reason um, I'm involved um, in the steering group that's actually conducting um, the study. So um, if, if, if I, as I say, galloping through um, uh, the time that I have been allotted, which was only four or five minutes, what, what I would like um, to um, leave you with is a change in Wales, which starts at the beginning of the next financial year, and it's called Allied Health Professionals. I'm sure you all know it. Um, AHP, and it's AHP for dementia. Um, and it's going to be difficult. Each of the health authorities are working to make sure that happens. I don't want to have to go back to my primary carer each time I need to be referred for some different type of care. So it's putting the teams together. Now I call that working smarter. We cannot ask um, the people that are involved in our care to work harder. They are, they are working 110%, um, but, it, but by simple restructuring, um, I call it simple, the biggest problem is going to be cultural, um, which isn't um, simple, is probably the only way um, or, or, or one, of, one of the few ways that we're going to be able to um, uh, improve care um, whilst um, we have this crisis. I've found it difficult to get myself discharged from hospital. I'll give you a, uh, that as a, uh, um, a throwaway comment simply because there aren't the um, carers available to provide um, the care that is in my social care plan. Um, that means I have to rely um, on um, my family. I live with dementia. Um, the problem is, um, because I live with dementia, so do my family and um, my friends. Um, they need um, the support probably as much um, as I do. Um, so I don't want to forget, um, I don't want to forget them um, whilst I talk about um, this particular issue. And I'd like to say, Obviously, I'd like to conclude by saying thank you very much. 
Um, at the last minute, I was given this opportunity um, to speak from Wales um, to um, this very um, influential group of individuals who can actually do things that will change things and make things happen. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Really, really powerful and great to, you know, all, all the brilliant stuff going on in Wales is, is worth recognising, um, uh, um, as we mentioned before. I'm going to now pass on, I think, to, to Stephen. We're working with Stephen and the Hallmark Foundation at ILC looking at um, um, a, a global health and prevention index. But um, Stephen has been in and around social care for a very long time, including at a political level. So your take on where we are, Stephen. Um, thank you, David. Um, thanks to Richard and to Andy. Uh, we definitely need a different approach. I don't think I've been around quite as long as Richard, but <laughs> we, we might contest that later. Um, so I, I approach this with a glass half full. I definitely think there is some light at the end of the tunnel, despite of events of recent weeks. Um, and three particular reasons why, which I'm going to address uh, swiftly this morning. One is that better care really is everybody's business. And I think we, we need to push that. Um, it's certainly, as Richard said, it's become much more of a pressing public issue. The second one is the need to unite behind a uh, set of shared principles and a shared vision. And then I just want to give some ideas and thoughts about kind of ways forward. Um, the, first of all, though, about better, better care being everybody's business. I mean, that might sound in one sense a, a glib phrase, but all of us, really all of us, need to get care, not just fixed, but actually uh, radically changed in, in the UK. Um, a a phrase, favourite phrase of mine from caring across generations in the US is that there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. Um, that really is, that's all of us. Um, in the UK, I'm not going to dwell on the past, but we must do better than the last 25 years. There's no doubt about that. Growing demand, huge needs in terms of dementia, our ageing population, but also our disabled population, as Richard said. We have really wasted, almost wasted, 25 years. And it's partially because, and certainly in the last 12 years or so, Dilnot was asked the wrong question by the government back in 2011. And not surprisingly, he has come up with the wrong answers. So... Uh, why do we need to unite? Um, well, part of the, the problem, I think, with the care system in the UK in particular is it's so fragmented and has multiple different interests. Uh, but as I said, care really is everybody's business. It's not about particular vested interests. But we must start and we must finish with people's experiences, as, as related by Andy, how people's lives could be improved by better care and their well-being improved. And we need, need to agree some overarching principles. And of course, we, all, we don't all wear one, just one hat. We all have many different perspectives on, on this issue, whether it's as relatives or friends or carers, providers, investors, people who draw on care. And as Andy says, we need all to work together to co-produce better care for the future. Now, some people have said this is an opportunity for a 1948 moment like the NHS, some statement about care, uh, the NHS being free at, at the point of need and delivery uh, and collective use and so on. Um, we haven't yet come to a kind of statement around that about care and support, uh, except I, I certainly believe it needs to be there when we need it and where we need it to enable everyone to live life to the full. Now, there is a statement out there from the social care future. I would urge people to have a look at that. That's one shared vision which people could unite behind. Um, I would, I would like to say, I mean, it's interesting hearing Andy's principles. I would like to hear an, a, a, a set of principles as well. And my, the five I would say, it's got to be fair, it's got to be simple, it's got to be sustainable, but it's also got to be personal and universal. Uh, but I'm sure others will have different views and we need to bring all of those together. The only thing I would urge is people to be ambitious and to think big about the future because progress, as we've seen from the last few years, Progress requires radical change. It's not about tinkering anymore. And if you want to read a report, uh, we have Care 2030, which is uh, by, published by the Hallmark Foundation, which sets out our vision for the future. So, um, 
seven very quick steps forward. First of all, we need proper, strong national leadership to set a bold strategic direction of where we're going to go. People, where, whoever they are, members of the public or people delivering care, have not been able to plan with any certainty over recent times. And we, we need people to be able to do that. But we also need coordination and resources delivered from a national level. Where there's a will, there's always a way. And that's my firm political belief. The second area, and I think this would support it, is to the government or maybe people in this room to commission the definitive cost-benefit analysis of universal care. What are the social and economic benefits? And I'm sure that would demonstrate the need for much greater investment. The third area is about moving from a crisis service, as we're in at the moment, to much more uh, focus on prevention and early intervention. And one example which I'm talking about with colleagues at the moment, at Hallmark Care Homes, is about how care homes be could become much more uh, community hubs, um, providing a whole range of support and services to people who live, older people in particular, who live in that local area alongside um, the residents that they currently serve. And then that links to the point that Richard made about joining up not just care and health, but housing. I think how, if we fix housing, we would actually uh, solve most of the care problems in the country. But it's not just about the home, it's also about the community people live in as well. It's about improving public transport, it's about community networks and local infrastructure. All about creating co connected communities. We need to make much better use of resources. We're, we're not making the best use of financial resources in the system at the moment, and we're not making best use of human resources. Um, there's too much emphasis on gatekeeping and not enough on using people's strengths and assets. And in particular, I mean, obviously, we need to invest in technology and do all of that stuff. But this care is a people business, and it will always remain a people business. And we need to particularly support family carers. And David raised the issue about ageing being a protected characteristic. Caring should also be a protected characteristic. And we're working with Carers UK on that. And then um, we need to promote care as a career, as a positive career that young people want to work in. Um, there are so many different roles in care at the moment, and we, we need to reach young people early, but going into schools and, and so on, recognising care, in making it valued, but also visible, and highlighting the skills you need as well. It's a skilled job. And finally, as I said, we need to start and end with well-being. It's the key to the life that we all want to live uh, now and, and in the future. And just one final, and for those of us in the UK, the next three years really are critical. Uh, we need to ensure that better care is on the agenda in the run-up to the next election. It's in all of the manifestos. And finally, it dominates the first year of the next government. Cultural change may take a bit longer, Andy. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, can I now introduce Georgina? Rich, Richard had that chart. Please come in if you answer. Richard had that chart of all of the white and green papers, and I think Richard will know that I've occasionally pulled together this tweet thread of every one of those and the one paragraph they say about technology and put it into this big thread. And they basically all say, back to the Wonders Report, technology will save us from ageing. And there is this one meaningless platitude around tech um, that we've been talking about for 25 years. So really delighted at the last minute to, again, to have um, Georgina sort of coming to talk about um, some, of the, um, some of the issues uh, from this perspective. Georgina. Thank you very much. I'm really honoured to be here um, today and quite a hard act to follow um, after our, our three speakers. But I pretty much agree with everything that they um, say. So hopefully that comes as no... Um, Surprise. So just to quickly tell you a bit about uh, Tech UK, that's the organisation that I represent. We are the trade body for the um, tech industry. Now, in my day to day, I work with tech suppliers that work closely with local government and various other social care um, providers. So, you know, I talk to local government to better understand, you know, what are the problems that you are trying to solve and then bring in the um, technology so for us even though there's tech in our name it's very much starting with the problem and outcome and then bringing in the um, technology 
I just want to start um, with a, a quote that I heard at the start of this week, also another quote from Social Care Futures from Neil um, Crow, their, their co-convener, who said, social care is not only underfunded, it is under-imagined. Um, and yeah, that really got me thinking, and I thought it ties in nicely with the name of today's panel, and I think it's a really good question. Um, and I think we are still in Groundhog Day, but because of that, it is forcing us to think differently. And we have to radically think differently. There's, we have no other option now. So I think to Andy's point, it is about, you know, how do we radically redesign the service and deliver it? And a big part of that is bringing in the users, our citizens, our residents, bringing in those across the, um, place unfortunately there isn't a money tree so we do have to take that place-based ap approach now to social care and I think technology can enable that whether that's kind of the data enabling both the local authority social care policing community groups to actually talk to each other to be able to proactively maybe identify those that are vulnerable that need that um, care. So I think that's one aspect where technology can definitely help. But it's also, again, using, I talk about technology, but also innovation to do things um, differently. At the start of the week, I was at a workshop with some London boroughs um, and um, suppliers with the London Office for Technology and innovation on new models of adult social care. And, you know, they gave the, the problem statement of, you know, do we carry on or what can we do differently? And it was great to hear from those in the room what they are doing, but also um, from some charities, social enterprises in how they're using technology to rethink um, delivery, but also to mobilize community to take that approach. So again, it's not about the technology, but starting with the people. So we're hearing from, um, you know, bud buddy apps, for example, that enable to match make people with similar interests. So it's kind of beyond the care, but enriching people's lives, tackling loneliness to um, helping to, again, tackle loneliness by enabling home share, so actually enabling that, you know, intergenerational um, connectedness, as, you know, someone mentioned, you know, there is the issue of housing. Um, so, you know, how can that, you know, how do we use that? To, how can we solve that to enable that greater uh, connection and enrichment across um, society? So I think, yeah, technology can definitely um, help there, but again, the great point around our, our workers, our carers, our unpaper, I think they can't be forgotten. They're a key part um, of that. And I think technology can often, you know, technology is the easy bit. We can procure it, we can give someone um, a tablet, we can tell them to do this, but we have to empower them, um, we have to train them, we have to give them the skills to be able um, to use that as well. So, you know, emerging technology such as automation, how that can help frontline um, workers to, you know, free up some of their time. So to automate the mundane tasks, so not, you know, displacing them, but compl helping them to complement what they do so they can spend more time with that, you know, face-to-face -face appointments or something, you know, that is quite complex. They actually now have the time to be able to focus on that and to actually, I can have that face-to-face -face, um time but i think it's again it's all about the the culture and bringing everyone on that journey to understand actually you know what motivates them and how the technology can help them so it's not about the technology but it's about the outcome that that can um enable and i think we're probably all in the room familiar with the various technologies such as you know um voice activated technologies that can help and the uh you know Internet of Things sensors, you know, if someone um, is at home and, you know, we can sense from a sensor, they make three cups of tea a day, but, you know, they've not made one that day, so alert goes off to, you know, their member, um, whether it's a family or friend member, to say, I think there's something wrong there. So there's those technologies as well um, at home that can make them feel, you know, more secure um, and safe, and I think, but with the technologies, it's not just about placing them in there because, you know, 
when we think of home, what do we think of? It's somewhere where we feel safe. So they need to be able to understand and you know be part of that process to so say actually yes i want this in my home to make me feel safe or i can connect with someone we don't want to just add in an additional technologies and create you know a sterile environment it's about bringing everyone on that journey so i think it's been great that we're hearing about um the culture as well but i appreciate that's not something that we can fix um overnight but hopefully technology can help mobilize us both the community and place to actually um deliver a new model of social care but um yeah i hope that was all right and it was a bit <laughs> last minute from me but um, brilliant thank, thank you. you very much thank you thank you and um I'm really sorry to have out, but I'm very conscious of time. So I think our panel is staying around so to ask some, have a bit of a conversation afterwards. But thank you all very much for joining us in this conversation bit now. Thanks.